from the 38-yard line. Wilson wants it all. Deep ball. Metcalf got it. Touchdown, Seattle. On fourth down, they leave the offense out there and not only get the first down, they deliver a strike to DK Metcalf. All right, we are back here. You just heard Fox Sports' is Adam Amin uh, calling the week one touchdown Russell Wilson bomb the DK Metcalf. It's a fun week one of football, and as is tradition on this podcast, the third year in a row, we are breaking down week one with the host of the Sharp Chatter podcast, Joe D'Aloisio. Joe, how are you? Mike, I'm doing well. I'm glad to be back on the podcast. Always enjoy our conversation. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. I have to say, though, week one, definitely a lot of fun to watch. I will say, not having the fans in the stands is definitely a little weird to get used to. Okay, see, uh, that's. Uh, I'm glad you're going to start there, because I think that's where we disagree a little bit. Um, I didn't mind no fans in the stands. You know, I actually enjoyed hearing the um, on-the-field banter um, whenever, whenever, you know, the curse words weren't uh, bleeped out by the broadcast crew. Um, I enjoyed the QB cadences, hearing them, you know, try to hard count, call the audibles. I like that. Also, you know, you look at the NFL rosters, right? They're so much bigger than any other professional sports. The sidelines looked packed, right? And I'm not saying they're not, they're obviously not fans, but they looked like people, people were there. And, and I, I thought, I thought that worked. Now, would I would I have loved to seen a, a miserable Browns fan sulking in, <laughs> in, in more disappointment? Absolutely. You know, this upcoming week, would I love to see a nice Lambo leap after Devontae Adams catches another touchdown? Of course, of course, I would. But you know, at the end of the day, I'm just I'm just glad football is back. Even with no fans, it's still some. It still feels a little bit normal. It feels like fall, right? Football's back. The action's back. The football was good. A lot of wacky things happened in week one, but you you could expect that considering the circumstances. Oh, for sure. I mean, we knew this week was going to be crazy because we had no preseason. We had no tra- We had an abbreviated training camp, no OTAs. There's a lot of questions about how things can go. And we led up to the billing for wacky week one. Because, I mean, you're coming out of week one. You have Jacksonville, Washington, Arizona are 1-0, while the 49ers, Vikings, Bucks, Colts, and Eagles are among those teams going 0-1. And you're sitting there at the end of the week. You're just going... Like, what the hell happened to week one? <laughs> 100%. And I would have never predicted that. I don't think anybody would have predicted that. And again, I think it just goes back to the, the, the wacky offseason that we had. Uh, practices being different. Oh, lack of OTA. No preseason game. Uh, I mean, you saw it on the injury front. You got a lot of guys that got hurt in week one. Uh, unfortunately, I think early on in this season, we're going to continue to see guys struggle through injuries. Hopefully, it's not that bad. But because of, you know... The, the different off season, we, we could expect the unexpected this year. Yeah, for sure. Let's start with your team. Let's start with the Packers here. They were probably one of the more impressive teams in week one. They absolutely blow the Vikings out. Aaron Rodgers was on a vintage performance. This is your big takeaway from the Packer Viking game. All right. My big takeaway is shame on any media member out there that has claim that Aaron Rodgers is done, that he's washed up, that he can't play. It's time to, you know, take a back seat. Shame on you, because he was absolutely electric um, against the Minnesota Vikings. I I thought the offense looked great. They were sharp. Um, One thing that I noticed in Rodgers, and and they, they alluded to it in the broadcast, obviously I follow the team a little bit closely, so I heard him speak about it throughout the offseason. Um, he did a lot of work this offseason with his legs and lower extremities, right? Um, and that's one thing that I've noticed, that Aaron Rodgers had a tendency over the last few years to almost look like he was constantly throwing off that that back foot or throwing unbalanced. And he looked so grounded and positioned this past week. You could tell all of his passes were crisp. They were on target. He didn't short any balls. He looked phenomenal. He really, he really looked like vintage Aaron Rodgers. Now, granted, you got a wide receiver like Devontae Adams. Of course, that helps, right? But he got production out of MVS. He got production out of Alan Lazard. I thought the offensive line, I think they deserve some credit too, all right? Rodgers did not get touched on Sunday. Billy Turner was out. Lucas Patrick and Lane Taylor, they both go out during the game. The Vikings secondary was atrocious. 
All right. But at the same time, that offensive line, Aaron Rodgers, they got it together. They were the glue to this offense. And it showed. It showed. Now, the other, the, the one downfall, I'm a little concerned with the Green Bay Packers defense. All right. I thought the Vikings were able to march down the field relatively too easy. I mean, they did give up a ton of points. The scoreboard is an indication of that. Um, I thought if the Vikings would have stayed loyal to the run, it could have been a, a different game, especially once Kenny Clark went down with an injury. Another guy that the Packers are hopeful doesn't miss a lot of time. Yeah, they've certainly had a great week one, and Rodgers did not look washed up. Another team where the quarterbacks did look a little washed, that Saints-Bucks game was certainly a lot different than people thought it was going to be. I will say Brady did not look very sharp in his first game of that new offense. Drew Brees did not do much to ease your concerns or worry about him fading like he did the second half of last year. What's your big thoughts after seeing some of that Saints-Bucks game? All right, see, I think everyone is starting to hit that panic button on the Bucks after that week one game. And I think that's absolutely crazy. Did Tom Brady look a little old, a little sluggish? Absolutely. There's no denying it. But again, I think Tom Brady and the Buccaneers will be perfectly fine. I have no problem with Bruce Arians calling him out. Um, I think the offseason played a tremendous role in the lack of chemistry, and it was evident, right? There were so many times where Brady and Evans weren't on the same page. Brady has never had the talent that he has right now in Tampa Bay. I think the more that these guys gel, this team is going to be dangerous. They're only going to get better, all right? Uh, there's no way five weeks from now we're having this, con- this same conversation. And if we are, I will be completely shocked, and I did not expect it at all. And as for the Saints, I mean, we can't discredit the Saints. They're one of the best teams in the NFC. There's no surprise there. Drew Brees looks phenomenal. They're one of the best teams in the NFL. But I think we need to slow down a little bit with the hitting the panic button on the Bucks just after one game. Yeah, I'll we'll dive deeper into the Bucks and the pick segment. We're we'll joined in just a bit by our Bucks fan, Charlie Borges. We are going to talk Tampa Bay and the picks. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But so much has this Sunday night game with the Cowboys and the Rams. And if you're a Cowboys fan, I I know you're, I mean, deep respect as a former, as a Packer guy who's seen Mike McCarthy be the head coach there. I don't know how much Mike McCarthy actually was the head coach of that team. It felt like all the same staff doing all the same things that they, they did last year, Jason McCarthy holding the headset instead of Jason Garrett. Yeah, you know what? Um, I don't want to say I was laughing, but I may have been laughing because <laughs> Mike McCarthy's time spent away from the game didn't didn't help him in any in any fashion. And you know that's that's a shame because the Dallas Cowboys have weapons all over that offense. All right, Dak Prescott looked good, Zeke looked great, C.D. Lamb, Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup. Um, Overall, though, I felt that this game was too close on the scoreboard, but it also felt like the Rams dominated the entire time. Um, Mike McCarthy's got to be better. He's got to be better. There's no excuse. It's your first game back in the NFL. Um, I expected them to really fire on all cylinders. It was it was concerning that you know you have that fourth and three decision. Who again? It depends who you ask, and it depends what happens. If Mike McCarthy and the Cowboys convert on that fourth and three, nobody's bashing him. But at the same time, you kick the field goal, you tie the game, you see what happens. Then you get a little unfortunate towards the end of the game. Michael Gallup, 47-yard reception, overturned because of that weak offensive pass interference call, which, by the way, Jalen Ramsey, he should be embarrassed for that flop, for that performance, that acting job that he did because the, the Cowboys got absolutely hosed on that one. I think, though, with the Cowboys, could be a, a, a similar story with the Bucks. all right? It's week one. Expectations are high. So let's pump the let's pump the brakes. Let's see where they are by week five. You know, I could see this Dallas team as long as they stay healthy, which you know injuries got to them already in week one. But I could see them midway through the season averaging thirty points a game. Yeah, the thing I'm intrigued by with Dallas, I think Mike Sando from the Athletic brought up on the podcast last week is this whole idea that you brought Mike McCarthy in, but you're not letting him call the plays. You're letting Kellen Moore who's been there for one year call the plays. And I also read somewhere else on the Athletic that basically this whole theory of you know like. Mike McCarthy was off. He's supposed to be bringing all his people with it. He brought none of his people in. He basically inherited the entire staff of Jerry Pick. So in my point perspective, the question is like, is Mike McCarthy really the head coach there if Jerry picked the staff and Jerry gave Kellen more play calling duties? I mean, let's be honest. Is anyone really the coach there as long as Jerry's there? No. Bingo. There's your answer. Yeah, it's just a, it's a shame because I do think McCarthy d- does – I think he should be able to bring in his own guys because – I get they like Callum Moore, but like 
Mike McCarthy, apparently he's been out for a year and he has been like sort of like studying the game, trying to prove it. Like you're kind of like, cutting him off if you're not letting him bring in his own people. And you're saying, okay, you have Kelly Moore, who's been our coordinator for one year and called plays for one year. He gets priority over you. I don't like that. I mean, I like the fact just because Kellen Moore has some sort of um, familiarity with the entire roster, with 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 Dak. Um, so I'm okay with that, but I could see it definitely being a potential problem in the long run. Yeah, I will. I will say also the Monday night games both intriguing. The Giants surprised me. I did not check the Giants plays well. They did for most of that game. I mean, the, that whole game turned the third quarter when Daniel Jones throws the rough interception in the red zone they were driving for the lead but i think they played much more competitive than i thought they would in that game yeah you know what they did play a lot more competitive the, a couple things though that that stood out to me um their their lack of ability to get the run game going with saquon barkley i mean not a good sign and that credit to to, to uh, the steelers uh but that stood out to me and, and you mentioned it daniel jones and his turnovers he's got to be better he's got to be better i mean i know it's year two but you, you can't be making some of those same mistakes that you're making. And that red zone interception that he had was unacceptable. It was pretty bad, but I will, as far as the run game goes, I'm going to give credit to the Steelers there. That's one of the best defenses in football. And they made it clear to take Saquon Barkley away from them. And I think the Giants will have more success running the ball this week in Chicago, considering the, the effort the Bears had against the Lions. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Again, you got to give, you got to give, um, the Steelers credit and if you got to give anyone credit with the Steelers and I know I'm going a little bit all over the place with this got to give Big Ben credit because I thought he looked great in his first game back from that elbow injury it's always good to see him healthy out there with, with Juju and, and how much better of a player Juju Smith is when he has a guy throwing him the ball yeah I also don't know how much you saw at the late game last night but I'm not feeling great about that Titans pick they did not look very good out in Denver and they got lucky at their, that the Broncos could not capitalize on a bunch of opportunities down the stretch so that game should not have been that close yeah, that that was a little concerning to me. I was concerned with um, with Ryan Tannehill's lack of ability to get AJ Brown involved in that game. You know, he he's big target, talented wide receiver. Really couldn't couldn't get him going. Kind of really relied on the tight end. You know, he got Corey Davis going. Also, can we talk about the kicking <laughs> or the lack there of kicking? Yeah, I mean, Christ. Now, in my, on the Sharp Cheddar podcast, I took the. I took the Titans at uh, minus one and a half, and I escaped that one. But my goodness, can we make a field goal here? What are we doing? Yeah, I mean, if he missed that kick last night, missed the twenty-five yard, he would have, he would not have gotten on the plane back to Tennessee. No, oh, I, I would have still probably not brought him back on the plane. I mean, they, uh, unexcusable. That was one of the worst kicking performances since my man Mason Crosby had a had a terrible afternoon in Detroit. Which, of course, I was at that game. Yeah, we're not, we won't relive that one, but I think Thank you. We'll, we'll, stick, we'll stick with the week one theme here. Like, What's the most surprising result you saw in week one? Um, the most surprising result, I would have to say the Washington football team taking down the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, I had very little to no expectations for the Washington team. I think I thought they'd be the one of, if not the worst team in the league. Still could happen. I mean, it's only week one, but um. Got to give credit where credit is due. Chase Young, that defensive line, that's a great group right there. That is a great unit. Chase Young looked really good. I feel bad for every single quarterback in that division because not only do they have to deal with Chase Young, but that entire unit. Kudos to Ron Rivera getting that IV at halftime so he could coach in the second half and be ready to go. I, I love everything that that guy's doing for that team right now. Yeah, and this is all, there's also a flip of last year's week one where they had the big lead in blue and the Eagles came back to win. This year, the Eagles have a blue a 17 nothing lead. The Redskins come back to win. So interesting deja vu there. Oh, absolutely, and if I'm an Eagles fan, I'm starting to get a little bit concerned with Carson Wentz. And if the Eagles can't figure out a way to protect Carson Wentz, he won't be playing a full season. I can guarantee that. Yeah, underrated there. The offensive line is getting old. I know they didn't have Lane Johnson on Sunday, but that's a concern, especially when you got the Rams coming in this week with Aaron Donald and company trying to harass Wentz again. I mean, you saw what Aaron Donald did to the, the Dallas' offensive line. He was tossing people around like they were dull. So, yeah. good luck. Yeah, I think my biggest surprise of the week, and shout out to Sandra Rosa, who Jaguars fans could be on the podcast later today, but she, like her, the Jaguars, they dominated the Colts in the second half of that game. They come back to win this contest, 27-17. Gardner Minshew's going 19 for 20 passing, and the Colts, Rivers turns the ball over. 
ugly performance out of the calls. And the Jags, I'm stunned one that game. I thought it was for sure a tanking for Trevor here. Yeah, that's the, you know that's another team again though. It's week one. This is this is the best week where we we always overreact and we always have the hottest takes early on. Let's see let's see where we are in a few weeks if we're still thinking that way. I mean, again, Garter Minshew, yeah, one incompletion. He threw three touchdowns. Didn't even reach two hundred yards. Not sustainable. Let's be honest. Not sustainable. Let's let's see them go up against a real offense. Let's see how that defense does. Again, you, th- you would have thought Phillip Rivers and company would have done a little bit better. They're still getting used to things. I wouldn't be so high on uh, on the Jacksonville Jaguars, but nonetheless, it was a surprise. It definitely was. Let's, let's take, speaking of the calls out of brutal loss, who else do you think had some really bad losses week one? Um, I would have to say the Detroit Lions. Um how do you let Mitch Trubisky score, throw three touchdowns in the fourth quarter? I, I, that's just unacceptable. It's Mitch Trubisky. You got to be better than that. But at the same time, it was like a typical Detroit Lions loss. Um, so I thought that was bad. And by the way, Dondre, DeAndre Swift, you got to catch that ball. You catch that ball, you win the game. No one's talking about Mitch Trubisky coming back. I'm tired of hearing about Mitch Trubisky. He's not a good quarterback. But um, I thought that was a big one. And, you know, it's a divisional game. You want to win those early ones. Um that was a brutal loss, and I think I could throw the Bengals into that conversation as well. Joe Burrow leads the team down the field, sets up a, a game a game tying field goal. Now, of course, you don't know what's going to happen if he makes the field goal, but he shanks it completely. I thought that was a bad loss as well. Yeah, that image of Joe Burrow's face on the side after the kick is missed, and you're like, "Welcome to the NFL, kid. Welcome to the Bengals." Exactly. It was like, "Oh God, here we go." I will say also in terms of the brutal loss category, as I talk about the top of the show, the Jets belong in there, but I'm also going to spotlight the Cleveland Browns here because they just completely no-showed against the Ravens. They got dismantled from top to bottom. I know Baltimore's a much better team they are, but for the talent Cleveland has, you shouldn't be losing that game 38-6. to No, but you know what? Again, it's the Cleveland Browns, and, and I'm sorry. I'm tired of the high expectations and, and, uh, and them falling flat on their face. I mean, it's it's every year. I want the Browns to be. I want the Browns to be a great football team in the NFL. But I'm tired of every year going into it saying, "All right, here it is. They got the talent. It's going to happen this year." And then they open up like that. Now, granted, the, the the Ravens are one of the best teams in the league. You know, Lamar Jackson is Lamar Jackson. He's got weapons all around him. That defense is good. You got to do better than scoring six points, though. You got to show up. They didn't even show up. Yeah, one thing I don't understand, and this is a little bit of a sneak peek at the at the week two show with the money here. How are they five and a half point favorites at home against the Bengals? I have no idea. That line I makes, have no idea. Makes no sense to me. Like, what made I you watch that true. game and say, you know what, this team is six points better than the Bengals? You know what, though, that's a game that everyone's going to jump on and everyone's going to lose. That's a game you don't touch. Yeah, I'm not planning on touching that one this week, but I will say also, like. In terms of the teams not showing, how'd you, do, how'd, you do, how'd you do this week? By the way, two and one. Okay, I did. I was three and zero. Oh, just saying, not to brag, but I just wanted to let you know that. Yeah, I had the one I lost on was the Eagles because I had them laying the points, and then I was looking good for the half, and they just completely collapsed. Yeah, all right. Yeah, it, it, that was a tough one. That was a tough one to swallow. Yeah, it was a tough. It was a tough pill to swallow this week. Just like my Jet game, and I talk about this at the top of the podcast, but. Man, oh man, I'm sick and tired of like the excuses at this football team. It's it's brutal. Yeah, it's brutal. What 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 what, are you, what what excuse are you most tired of? Oh, like, oh, like the there's no talent. Like oh, like we like you guys got hurt. we had the injuries. Like and I'm sitting there. I'm like I'm, I'm like I'm watching Washington come back with no offensive skill players find a way to win this game. I'm watching the Jaguars and Gardner Minshew like put lighting up the Colts defense down the stretch. And here I got the Jets sitting here running screens on on starting goal from the like th- on third down from the fifth from the fifteen yard line with no time on the clock and running draws every second and ten play on earth. Come on, got to be better than that. You got to be better than that. No, this team's gonna be. And if you watch that, you clearly know this team is not going to the playoffs again. And this could be a decade with the, with no playoffs with the Jets. And there's no end in sight because this owner seems to have no or, or, or urgency to try and put a winner together. Well. I know I don't I don't mean to flip the script here, change up the sports, but at least you're a Mets fan, Stevie Cohen, so you should be happy about that. 
I should be happy about that. Like, it'd be nice if you could take his fourteen, some of his fourteen billion, buy the Jets too, and get rid of Woody and actually run that team. Let them win. Never say never. I will never say never. And we'll look ahead to week two for a minute. Which team do you think can least afford to go zero and two here? Because you know zero and two is almost always a death sentence in this league. Yeah, zero and two is always a death sentence in this league. And you look at their matchup in week two, and I don't think they will go zero and two. But I think it's the Forty ers all right, they're the only winless team in that division. They arguably dropped their first game against the weakest divisional opponent. Um, luckily, they're playing the Jets. So the odds of going 0-2, very slim. But if somehow, some way, Sam Darnold becomes Joe Namath and, and the Jets upset the 49ers, the 49ers are in big big trouble. I'm hitting the panic button two weeks in. Losing to, to the Arizona Cardinals and the Jets? Absolutely. This team's in trouble. As somebody who sat there and watched most of that Jet game in week one, I will tell you for a fact, you hammer the 49ers in this game. You <laughs> hammer the money wise. Especially with no Le'Veon Bell on the Jets this week. He's probably going to be out with the hamstring. The Jets have no playmakers. They have no offensive. The offensive line's going to struggle with their pass rush. George Hill doesn't have to play this game. The 49ers are going to win easily. No. Listen. I expect the 49ers to win easily, but I think that's, you know, that's a perfect team that, you know, they were just in the Super Bowl last year. You start the season 0 and 2, it's going to be it's going to be a, a tough road to recover. Yeah, I think the other games intriguing like in terms of the 0 and 2 potentials here. Like I don't think if you're the Vikings you want to go 0 and 2 either because you lost a brutal divisional game in Green Bay, you're going to Indianapolis and this is a game you can win because that's you run the ball with Dalvin Cook, but like I think they have to find a way to win that game. Uh, that's a big one. That's another big one as well. Yeah, I looked up the 49ers are minus 295 on the money line this week, so heavy favorites. Heavy favorites, but a heavy payout if you go on the opposite end for the, and you're, you're feeling a little risque and you take the Jets. Yeah, well, I'm not going anywhere near that. I don't blame you. I wouldn't either. Not enough money in this world to make me even contemplate that. Yeah, let's wrap it up. Let's look ahead to week two for a little bit. What games are you looking forward to this week? Who, what's got you excited? Yeah, I think the, the, there's one game that really got the juices flowing for me, and I think that's the, the biggest matchup of the week, that Sunday night game between the Patriots and the Seahawks. All right, Both these teams, they start off the season 1-0, and but you know now the Patriots, Bill Belichick, and Cam Newton, they get a real test. Okay, yeah, they beat the Miami Dolphins. Big deal. All right, Cam Newton looked good. Bill Belichick utilized him the right way, I thought. Let's see how they perform against one of the top teams in the NFC, one of the top teams in the league. On the flip side with Seattle, Russell Wilson and the Seahawks looked really good week one against the Falcons. All right, I think Russell Wilson had an MVP kind of, kind of a game. You know, can he continue to play at that level? I think we learn most, though, about the Patriots this upcoming week because if the Patriots could win against Seattle, I think that says a lot about this team. It says a lot about Bill Belichick and what he's doing in New England and what he has been doing for the last 20-plus years in New England. Yeah, that's one I'm definitely going to watch. Other ones I think I'm keeping an eye on here, that Atlanta-Dallas game, the both of them try to try away going out to. That's got a shootout potential, in my opinion. I think I'm also intrigued by the Rams and the Eagles because, again, like, the Rams defensive line against Philly's offensive line is the key to that game. That'll be a lot of fun to watch. And I think, underratedly, Washington and Arizona, all those teams are going to be 2-0 and have a great like, head start towards the playoffs. Yeah, no, I agree with that one. That was kind of under the radar. One of them is will go 2-0, and and it, you got a lot of good storylines right there. Right? You have Chase Young, you have Kyler Murray, two of the young, hopefully young studs, future studs in the NFL. So that, that will be... That will be a game that a lot more people will tune into and watch um, after the week one outcomes, for sure. I think that's going to be, like, if you're a red zone person, that's in the 405 slot. I don't think either CBS games get in, the, in the doubleheader window be very compelling. I feel like that's going to be one you'll be watching red zone, hoping they keep flipping back to it for the scoring opportunities in that. You got to. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. All right, Joe. Thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, I'll be able to follow on social media and keep up with the Sharp Cheddar podcast. All right, yeah, Mike, just give me a follow on Twitter at Joe double underscore. Don't forget that double. Don't forget the double, D-A-L-O-I-S-I-O. New Sharp Cheddar podcast dropping uh, shortly. I'll have my recap of week one, what was good, what was bad with the Packers, as well as my week one headlines. And then later in the week, 
Uh, we'll have a little preview episode where I get my picks of the week, try to get someone on from Detroit to give me a perspective on the Lions and preview that game, all that fun stuff, Mike. All right, Joe. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Mike, anytime. Thanks for having me. All right. Up next, we are going to do our week two NFL picks with Charlie Borges right after this.